ahead and get started. So once again, for those of you who just joined us, my name is Dr. Alexandra McKillop. Um, I'm on the functional medicine team at Align Modern Health. And today we're going to be talking about food sensitivities, food allergies, and food intolerances, and how we approach those conditions through functional medicine. Let's get started here. First things first, a little bit of a background about what we do at Align. We are integrative clinics, and we have about 18 clinics around the Chicagoland area. And integrative medicine means that there's a team of providers with different specialties who all work together to treat a patient and help them get to the root cause of their concerns so that we can treat them as a whole person and not just a symptom. Uh, so on our team, we have chiropractic and physical medicine. They focus largely on musculoskeletal pain, um, and they work very closely with our clinical massage therapy team. We also have acupuncture, um, which addresses lots of different health conditions, including stress and anxiety, um, men's and women's concerns, fatigue, um, and then the functional medicine and clinical nutrition team, which is my wheelhouse. Uh, we treat a lot of different conditions as well, everything from GI and autoimmune disorders, um, food sensitivities, weight management, reproductive health, fertility, all that good stuff. So um, we have lots of different interests here and lots of tools for helping a patient recover so they can live the best life for them. A little bit more about myself and my background. So as I mentioned, I'm a functional medicine doctor here at Align. I work out of the Mont Prospect office where I see patients in person as well as via telemedicine. Um, Post-graduation, I studied a lot about food sensitivities as well as GI health, autoimmunity, inflammation. Um, I have a particular interest in women's health, fertility, and reproductive concerns. Um, however, that being said, uh, women and men alike both have many different types of health concerns. So that's kind of a large umbrella ter term for pretty much anything that can afflict a person. Um, my favorite part of work in functional medicine is the opportunity that I have to develop a relationship with my patients, understand what makes them tick, and understand what is important to them about their health so that we can address their individual values and help them live a life that they love. Let's jump into um, the details here. To set the stage for what functional medicine is, I like to use this example here of um, what functional medicine does in comparison to maybe a standard medical provider and how they approach health. So in functional medicine, we understand that one condition can have many different causes. So depression, as an example, uh, a very common problem in today's day and age, if you were to see a traditional provider, they would recommend either therapy or an antidepressant. Um, and that's kind of what they would do for everybody who deals with depression. In functional medicine, we want to figure out what's causing that depression. So we understand that there can be circumstantial problems, but nutrient deficiencies, hormonal imbalances, and some other lifestyle or um, environmental problems can contribute to the development of depression. And in order to treat that problem and prevent it from coming back, we need to address that root cause. Now, on the other hand, we understand that a single root cause, perhaps what was causing depression, can also lead to the development of other types of conditions and symptoms. So inflammation, as an example here on the right-hand side of my screen, inflammation can contribute to the onset of depression, but it also can contribute to arthritis, cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. So by addressing inflammation as the root cause, we're not only getting to the bottom of the patient's depression, but also helping to prevent the onset of some of those other inflammatory type conditions. So that's a little bit of the difference there about functional medicine as a whole and how we approach things. Now getting specifically into our topic about food sensitivities, I like to start with a good old fashioned definition. So the way that I like to define food sensitivities actually ties very, very closely to a different conversation, which is understanding the immune system. So let's start there, actually. Our immune system is built from different chemicals and different types of cells that float around in our blood or that reside in different organs in our bodies. And their, that job, the job of our immune system is to identify what in our environment is a good guy and what is a bad guy. And if those bad guys get inside our bodies, our immune system's job is to fight them off. So this is obviously really good if we're in a situation where we have strep throat or COVID or another type of bacterial, viral, fungal infection. Um, it's helping to protect us from foreign invaders. However, the immune system can go awry and it can start to identify good things as foreign invaders, things like 
food, um, which obviously is a good thing that we should be able to eat and use as our bodies require. So a food sensitivity is one example of when our immune system starts to react against something good food in particular. Um, it recognizes an apple or an avocado as something that doesn't belong in the body and it starts to create a response against it to clear it away and prevent it from doing any damage to our cells. We can react against whole foods like an apple or an avocado, even healthy things like apples and avocados. Um, but we also can react to different chemical components of foods like enzymes or lectins, if you're familiar with what those are, food additives, including artificial colorings, um, Red Lake 40, <laughs> those sorts of things that you might read on a food label, gums, which are different additives to change the texture, lots of different things that are existing in both naturally occurring foods like an apple straight off the tree, as well as processed food items that have been manufactured or changed in some way. When our immune system reacts to those things, reacting to food, um, the symptoms we experience can be different from each other for different people. Some people experience food sensitivities with GI problems, other people experience them with headaches or fatigue. So it looks diversified in terms of the symptoms that present when a person has a food sensitivity. Food sensitivities are important for health, not just because we can have symptoms associated with them, but because they can contribute to the development of other types of disorders that are a little bit more difficult to manage or that maybe can become lifelong problems. Um, fatigue syndromes, autoimmunity, thyroid dysfunction, reproductive health problems, systemic pain and inflammation and GI problems, digestion problems, all of those things can be affected by food sensitivities. On the other hand, when a person has those um, disorders, sometimes they can mimic a food sensitivity. So the problem might be much more simple than perhaps it looks. And we'll dive into the details of what all of that means in these coming slides here. Next big question that we need to sort out here in, in terms of food sensitivities is how they differ from food allergies. So food allergies and food sensitivities are different from each other in a couple of key ways um, in terms of the timeline, the implications, the frequency, and the symptoms. Let's talk about the immune system again for just one minute before we dive into these two. Both food allergies and food sensitivities are a manifestation of immune reactivity against food. Your immune system identifies food as a problem and starts to react against it. The way that your immune system does that is different between food allergies and food sensitivities. And the difference comes from antibodies. So many of you have probably heard of the concept of antibodies. Um, and there are different types of antibodies that are specific to different things. And there are different classes of antibodies. What I mean by that is you can have one type of antibody against strep throat and another type of antibody against COVID. Those are specific antibodies, but you can have two different classes of antibodies too. You could have IgG or IgE antibodies against strep throat. You could have IgG or IgE antibodies against COVID or against apples or against avocados. So if you can see where I'm going here, there are many different classes of antibodies, and then you can have specific antibodies from each class against different things. This is important because with food allergies, the type of antibody, IgE, allergy, is specific to the class of food allergies. So it's always IgE with food allergies. Food sensitivities can come from other classes of antibodies, IgG, IgA, etc. So that's where the difference comes from on a chemical level. But then there's also these other categories here of differences that I touched on just a moment ago. So let's start with timeline. Food allergies typically come on very quickly. They are immediate, minutes to hours, sometimes even faster than that, immediately, right? You eat something and all of a sudden it's very obvious that you're having a reaction. On the contrary, food sensitivities can be delayed and most oftentimes they are. So when we're talking about the timeline for food sensitivities, it ends up being hours to days, sometimes up to 72 hours, which is multiple days. 
that makes it difficult to identify, okay, I, what is it that I ate that's causing my problem? I've eaten a lot of things over the past three days, whereas if it was, what did I eat 30 minutes ago? It's a lot more um, straightforward, what might be causing the problem. Food allergies also are a little bit more significant in the sense that the implications or the sequelae are potentially life-threatening. So, you know, the anaphylactic shot, needing an EpiPen, calling 911 type reaction. Food sensitivities are not life-threatening. Those symptoms associated with food sensitivities are more of a chronic issue, more of a vague, nonspecific, as opposed to 911 emergency. Another difference is with the frequency. So food allergies are relatively less common. About 10% of the population has a food allergy at some point in time. Food sensitivities, on the other hand, are much more common in comparison. Up to 30% of the population is estimated to have a food sensitivity. And the frequency of food sensitivities is increasing because of a number of different factors in our own health, um, our exposure to chemicals, the chemicals we use with food and manufacturing, lots of reasons there. And then the symptoms differ between food allergies and food sensitivities as well. So food allergies, the classic presentation would be hives, swelling, itching, the potential for anaphylaxis, which is that difficulty breathing, that's the emergency situation. Food sensitivities, on the other hand, um, the symptoms, although they can be similar to hives, excuse me, similar to food allergies, uh, think like skin problems, dermatitis or itching, there are also digestive problems that can come from food sensitivities, migraines and brain fog from neurological problems, um, irregularity in bowel movements. Food sensitivities also can trigger symptoms of other conditions like autoimmune conditions. How do food sensitivities develop? Another key question that we have here. Um, so we talked about what food sensitivities are and the place that they come from, which is a dysfunctional response of the immune system. We need to take it a step deeper here, actually, in terms of where our immune system comes from. So our GI system or our gastrointestinal system or gut is the foundation of our immune system. That's where our immune system is housed. And it's the first place that things from outside the world come in contact into inside of our bodies. So we eat food, we take it from outside our bodies and put it into us. We breathe something in that gets caught in our saliva. We swallow our saliva. Um, all of those environmental things come internally through our GI system. And that's where our immune system first has the opportunity to interact with them. And its job is to say, hey, is this apple food? Is that good? Or is this strep throat bacteria, bad, something I need to fight off. So that's where your immune system first has contact with the outside world and then needs to make a decision about it. Sometimes when we have problems with our GI system, um, which can come from a number of different areas, we develop irritation and inflammation of our GI system. And that causes a breakdown in our immune system's ability to interact with and make decisions about what's inside of the, the gut. And here's kind of how it happens. When we think about our gut, I'd like you to think about it like a paper towel roll, a long tube. And on the inside of that tube, there's a layer of cells that are moist. It's called the mucosa. And that's the, the job of that mucosa is to keep the inside of the gut, that long tube, secure and well-contained. Its job is to keep stuff from inside the gut from getting out into your bloodstream. When you have irritation or inflammation of those cells, we start to have breakdown of that barrier. So if you think about the cells as fitting together like my knuckles, they fit together pretty well. If you have irritation and inflammation, it causes those cells to swell and they pull apart. And now you can see that there's gaps between my knuckles. When you have a, um, a gap that develops, you lose what's called a tight junction. So they were tightly together and now they are swollen and they pulled apart a little bit. And particles from inside the GI system now can leak in between those gaps and come into contact with the tiny blood vessels that line the GI system and get into the bloodstream. That's a problem because food particles are supposed to be in our gut, not in our bloodstream. And if you get these particles, whether they be food particles or bacteria or other types of chemicals into your bloodstream, your immune system says, whoa, that's a problem. I need to clean this up and get it out of my blood so that I don't develop an infection. 
Um, an infection of your blood would be life threatening sometimes. And so it's really important that the immune system is doing that. However, it shouldn't be having to do that because of food particles in your bloodstream that never were supposed to be there in the first place. So if you've heard of the phrase leaky gut, um, that's referring to this process of loss of the integrity of the cell lining of the GI system, allowing food particles, bacteria, and other chemicals to get into your bloodstream that shouldn't be getting into your bloodstream. When that happens, it elicits an immune reaction, and then your immune system starts to react to food, for example, um, when it otherwise would not. And then you develop that food sensitivity. Your immune system says, hey, apples don't belong here, and now I'm going to start reacting to apples every single time they come into contact with my body. Lots of different things can cause the loss of that integrity or intestinal permeability or leaky gut. Um, stress is a big one that changes the chemical environment of the gut and can lead to inflammation, as can GI dysbiosis, which is a term that we use to refer to an imbalance of good bacteria and bad bacteria. Some dietary proteins on their own can cause GI inflammation. So for about 20% of the population, gluten is a problem and gluten can cause that to develop. Chemical toxicity, drug exposure, whether that's from prescription drugs um, or other types of exposures in the environment or things that we might be doing or using. Protein deficiency can also be a problem. So if you don't get enough of what you need to be getting from your diet, Genetic factors can contribute, so things that you inherit from your parents, um, and surgery. That one's pretty straightforward. If you cut a hole in your GI system now, there's going to be a, a hole there, and things are going to have the opportunity to mix with the blood vessels and get into the bloodstream when they otherwise would not. All right, so who should be tested for food sensitivities? Um, starting with that conversation we were just having about the GI system, People who have GI disorders should typically be tested for food sensitivities because of what we know about GI dysfunction, inflammation, and the potential for developing intestinal permeability or leaky gut. Um, our mucosa, so that cellular lining of the GI tract is the first line of defense of our immune system against foreign invaders and it needs to make those decisions. And so if you have a problem with your GI system, it's more likely that your immune system is going to start reacting when it otherwise would not. People who have poor digestion also would need to be tested for food sensitivities. And the reason is because if you're eating an apple, um, you're supposed to digest the apple a little bit as it travels all the way through your GI system so that by the time it gets to the lower part of your digestive tract, it's almost completely digested. If you aren't digesting your food all the way, different particles are going to come into contact with your immune system that otherwise wouldn't be there because they would be broken down. And that can cause a problem in terms of initiating a reaction on its own, or it can cause a problem with the balance of good and bad bacteria, um, or those food particles can um, contribute to other diseases of the GI system that irritate a chronic issue. As I kind of mentioned earlier, dysbiotic flora and dysfunction. So um, that would be an imbalance in good and bad bacteria. Of course, if you have bad bacteria or a pathogen, um, that's going to create irritation, inflammation, and potentially lead to intestinal permeability and development of food sensitivities. Another note here is about asymptomatic GI disorders. So that would be a situation where a person has been diagnosed with a GI disorder, but it's in remission. So they're not actively having symptoms, but they had at a previous time or they sometimes have flares. If you aren't having symptoms, it doesn't mean that the problem isn't there anymore. It just means that it's not actively bad enough to make you aware of it. So people who have a, a personal history of GI problems like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, things that come and go in flares, um, they likely still have a low-grade simmering inflammatory process leading to irritation of the GI system and leaky gut potentially. Um, a little bit of a review down here, some of the things that can be examples of GI disorders that cause problems like food sensitivities would be SIBO, which is a type of bacterial infection, IBS or Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, Food poisoning can do this. Of course, if you're having um, irritation of the GI system, it's causing vomiting, diarrhea, that's going to be causing irritation. Constipation, gas and bloating. International travel is on here because 
if your body is used to a certain balance of good and bad bacteria, and you travel to a different part of the world where there are different normal microbes that your body's not used to, your immune system might start reacting to those things. And part of that process can create irritation and intestinal permeability. Same thing is with a family history of GI disorders. So if a family member has something like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, or some other GI disorder, but you have never been diagnosed with it, it could be a situation that's similar to remission where it hasn't ever gotten bad enough for you to recognize it's a problem, but there's still a low grade kind of simmering chronic irritation and inflammation. Other people that should be tested for food sensitivities would be autoimmune disorders, people who have autoimmune disorders. Um, and that's because an autoimmune disorder is another example of your immune system reacting to something that it's not supposed to react to. So food sensitivities would be your immune system reacting to food. Autoimmunity is your immune system reacting to your own cells, which is obviously a bigger problem. Um, food sensitivities can lead to the development of autoimmune disorders, or they can trigger a previously existing autoimmune disorder and flare it up. Um, the reason that this happens is because if food particles are getting into your bloodstream, they can bind to your own cells and that might cause your, your immune system to react not only to the apple particle or the avocado particle, but to whatever cell it was binding to. So let's say that there's gluten in your bloodstream and you have a food sensitivity to gluten, that gluten goes and binds to your thyroid, your immune system is now going to react to gluten, which it has been doing, but now it's gonna start also reacting to your thyroid and reacting to your own tissue, your own thyroid leads to the development of autoimmune thyroid problems or autoimmune disorders of another type. Food particles can also look like your own tissue. So that's what we call molecular mimicry. It's when a chemical found in food looks chemically similar to your own body. And if your immune system starts to react to that food particle, it can get confused and react to your own body. And anytime we're reacting to our own bodies, um, that can trigger existing autoimmune disorders or lead to the development of new autoimmune disorders. Whenever you're reacting to that tissue, it can lead to the development of specific types of autoimmune disorders or just widespread autoimmune reactivity. So something like lupus, um, type one diabetes, Crohn's disease, autism, Bissett disease, multiple sclerosis. Those are all categories of illnesses that have some component of self-reactivity. Not all of them are specifically autoimmune disorders, but they have that self-reactivity as a component. Other people that should be tested for food sensitivities would be people who have inflammatory disorders. So inflammation is a natural consequence of your immune system reacting. Um, that's because the way our immune system functions is to actually destroy any cell that is a foreign invader or is inf infected by a foreign invader. So an example of that would be strep throat. If you have strep throat, your throat hurts because your immune system is actually destroying your own throat cells because they're infected with the strep throat bacteria. That creates inflammation and pain. If you have another type of inflammatory disorder, um, which is a chronic problem for you, and then you have a food sensitivity on top of that, you're going to be creating additional inflammation, which then leads to inflammation on top of inflammation on top of inflammation, um, which is just like an out of control inflammatory process. So this is an example of how food sensitivities can worsen inflammatory disorders because they by themselves lead to inflammation. So people who have inflammatory disorders that they know of should get tested for food sensitivities because the food sensitivities could be worsening their existing condition. Similarly, inflammation on its own tends to drive autoimmune reactions. So if somebody has an autoimmune disorder and then they have a food sensitivity which creates inflammation, that inflammation feeds forward into autoimmunity, which feeds forward into creating inflammation. And that's another kind of out of control process that needs to be interrupted somewhere or the ball is just gonna keep rolling downhill. Inflammatory disorders include, but are not limited to fatty liver disease, endometriosis, type two diabetes, asthma, obesity, Alzheimer's, cancer, the list goes on. Um, many, many types of disorders are characterized by inflammation. All right, other people who have unexplained or vague symptoms like GI problems, nausea, heartburn, bloating, headaches, irritability, or nervousness, brain fog. Um, it's also a good idea to get tested for food sensitivities in these situations because those 
um, conditions or those symptoms can be related to food sensitivities, which is relatively straightforward, or they could be related to something else. And if you rule out food sensitivities as contributing, it makes it a lot easier to get to another type of diagnosis. Um, or sometimes people have been through the ringer of testing and nothing is manifesting as a reason when it really was just food sensitivities the whole time. Let's talk a little bit about how we test for food sensitivities. So the key for testing is that you want to make sure that you have good data to inform a decision about whether or not you should eat or remove a food from your diet. One of the ways that we can do this is with a blood test. The other way is that is popular on the internet is with what's called an elimination or provocation diet. An elimination or provocation diet involves avoiding an, a suspected food problem, so corn or gluten or whatever, for a period of time and then reintroducing it to see if there's a reaction. This can be a little bit challenging for a couple of different reasons, and it's not the preferred way to identify food sensitivities because it's not as specific and it can actually lead to some, uh, some problems on its own. So let's talk about what those could be. First thing is when we talk about testing in comparison to elimination diets, testing gives very objective evidence about whether or not the immune system is actively interacting with a food or a food component. Suspicions of sensitivity are not enough of a reason to eliminate a food because that actually requires a lot of time, energy, and um, mental focus. It affects your life to be removing something from your diet. Um, so all recommendations regarding the diagnosis of food sensitivities really should be informed by objective data and evidence basis. Similarly, we touched on this earlier that food sensitivities have ambiguous timelines. While allergies come on within minutes to hours after eating the food, food sensitivities are delayed. They could be hours to days later. And I don't know about you, but I don't remember what I ate three days ago. I hardly remember what I ate yesterday, but I know what I ate 30 minutes ago. So the difficulty comes in diagnosing because there are lots of different things that we come in contact through over the course of time. And if the reaction isn't immediate, it's really hard to be sure that that's what the problem is. Food sensitivities also create elusive sy symptoms and the food sensitivity symptoms are not exclusive. So what I mean by that is you could get a headache from lots of different things. You could have slept poorly. You could be coming down with an infection. You could be going through caffeine withdrawal or maybe you hit your head or you have a food sensitivity. We don't know. Um, so that is an example of how one symptom is not exclusively related to food sensitivities. So if you take gluten out of your diet to see if it's contributing to your headaches, you could get a headache tomorrow because you looked at the sun for too long. Um, and you might think, oh, I got a headache because it's, it means I'm not reactive to gluten, even though you are reactive to gluten. Um, so you can kind of see the difficulty there because avoiding gluten doesn't mean you're never going to get another headache, even if gluten contributes to your headaches. And the last piece here that's really important is that um, using an elimination diet to try to identify food sensitivities can lead to you to feel preoccupied about food and eating, concern with your physical well being, sometimes fear that a food might harm you um, when you might not be sensitive to that food at all. And that's really significant because our relationship with food is a big quality of life issue. It's a gift that should be enjoyed, um, not something that we should be worrying about harming us. And so if we are thinking about, oh my goodness, I'm avoiding gluten, is it, is it, the gluten that was causing my symptoms, do I feel better? You can kind of get into your head about it and that really affects your quality of life and it can lead to the development of disordered eating, an unhealthy relationship with food or new onset or relapse into eating disorders, which in medicine, our commitment is to first do no harm. And so we need to make sure that by using an elimination diet, we're not actually harming a patient. Another example of why food testing is more clinically useful than an elimination diet is because one chemical component of wheat um, could be causing a reaction, but another chemical component of wheat, as an example, might not be causing the reaction. So you could be reactive to wheat germ agglutinin, but not to gliadin toxic peptides, for example, when both are present in wheat. So that's another area that testing comes into play because if you're just avoiding wheat, you don't know if it's the wheat itself or one chemical, a different chemical, and that chemical could be present in other foods as well. And that information allows us to inform further testing. 
if you're reactive to one component of wheat that's also present, for example, in whey protein or oats or millet, then we have a reason to test you for some of these other food sensitivities. Whereas you might never know that you were reactive to something that wasn't part of your elimination diet. Another reason that elimination diets can be a little bit impractical is because if you look at this comprehensive list of what a food sensitivity test is looking for, there's a lot of different types of foods here. And I don't know about you, but if you were, I removed all of these things from my diet, I would have nothing left. And if I was trying to avoid those things for a period of three months, I would be living on pretty much air and water. And I don't think that I can become photosynthetic anytime soon. So having a test that tells me whether or not I'm reacting to one of these food items is gonna be super, super helpful so that I don't have to try to um, eliminate everything from my diet and figure out why I feel crummy when really it's because I'm eating nothing and having um, nutritional deficiencies as a result. All right, so that wraps up our conversation here about food sensitivities. Um, I know we covered a lot, a lot of detail, and sometimes I speak quickly. So if you missed something, um, everybody who registered for this event will receive a copy of the presentation via email. And now we can transition over to the Q&A feature on Zoom. So I'll give you guys just a couple moments here to type your questions. It's the Q&A feature, not the chat box. Um, and then you can see here that we have some different insurance companies that are in contract with us for functional medicine. So if you wanted to book a 15 minute consult, that's also available to you. And you can talk more about some of your personal specific questions that you might have. Okay, I'm take one sip of water and then we'll jump into the Q&A session. All right, so this question here, it says, um, I brought up poor digestion and used apple as an example. Are there examples of food like corn where we could expect poor digestion or is partially undigested food always a sign that we might be suffering from poor digestion? Um, as a generalized answer, if you notice undigested food in your stool, so something that looks like what it looked like when you put it in your mouth, that's typically an indication that you didn't break it down. Um, the digestive process by its nature should be breaking down our food, converting it into a different looking substance, breaking it down into different chemical components. So if you see it coming out and it looks like it looked when it came in, um, then that's a clear sign that you're not digesting it. Okay, um, another question here says, uh, if I were to go to my GI doctor and ask for food sensitivity testing, what type of test should I ask to be performed? That's a really good question. So food sensitivity testing is, above and beyond when it comes to medicine. It's not the standard. Uh, most of the time when you go to a GI doctor, they're going to be looking for things that are immediate problems. So like a 911 emergency or cancer or something that really involves um, high level treatment where a food sensitivity, while it's definitely a significant problem, it's not the standard when you go to a GI doctor. And most GI doctors actually don't perform food sensitivity testing, um, which is where the field of functional medicine comes in, because we know it's dysfunctional to be, re be reacting to food. You should be able to eat food. And if you, if you can't without feeling sick, that's a problem. So I would encourage you to find a functional medicine doctor um, or book a consult with one of our providers at AMH. Um, another person says, is that why if I eat gluten, it aggravates my symptoms? It could be. Um, once again, lots of things could be contributing to the symptoms you're experiencing. Could be gluten, could be dairy, could be another thing that you typically eat with gluten, or it could be something you ate three days ago. Another question here, does Align do food sensitivity testing? Yes, we do. Um, the cost varies per patient per the type of test that is completed. So I'd encourage you to uh, make an appointment with a provider to talk a little bit more. All right. Okay, so another question here that's uh, really good. I've heard that there are seasonal allergy shots that you can get to reduce the impact of pollen allergy. Is there something similar for food allergies? So food allergies in specific, or as a specific example, it depends. Some, some people have um, the appropriate circumstances, which makes them eligible for what's called oral immunotherapy, which is something that's done by immunologists. Food sensitivities are a little bit different than that. Um, and there is a way to rehabilitate food sensitivities 
for many people, not everybody, and that comes down to addressing what's causing the food sensitivity, which would be like a GI problem or a gut problem. So one of the ways that we address that is by doing testing, not just for the immune system, but for the gut as well. Another person says, could it be the way that wheat is processed in the US? Maybe even the pesticides used. Pesticides used. I did not have the same problem as when I ate wheat products in China. Um, there are many theories about what's contributing to the onset and the rise in food sensitivities in the United States. Um, many people find that they can tolerate wheat or gluten as it was grown in another area. And I think our farming practices definitely contribute. There's a lot of data on that to our body's loss of the ability to tolerate those food components. Can food sensitivities go away? Somebody else asked. Um, I noticed that I was sensitive to coconuts. Um, I love coconuts and never noticed an issue with eating them. Um, or I tested that I was sensitive to coconuts. I see. So some people are able to recover from those food sensitivities, particularly when the root cause of them is, is addressed. Okay. My daughter had an allergy test where they pricked her skin and they said she has no allergies. She reacts to many different foods with itchy mouth or, mouth or face. How can that test come up negative? So that's an excellent example of the difference between allergies and food sensitivities. The skin prick test is classic as one type of testing for food allergies, which are different from sensitivities because it's a different division of the immune system that's involved. Okay, is there a food group to eat to heal the disruption of... Uh, the GI lining and calm it down? Um, yes and no. Uh, it depends on the individual patient. So if there are um, particular circumstances that's leading to GI inflammation for an individual person, those things would need to be addressed. Um, and if, for example, uh, you are one of those 20% of the population that reacts to gluten, gluten could be causing the GI problems, et cetera. So there's a lot of nuance to this, as you can see. And as we're picking up and running out of time here and finishing up, I do want to point out that every single patient is individual. So it can't just be a, if this, then that, when it comes to medicine, we always need to take into account the circumstances and rule out other problems. Um, and that's where working with a healthcare provider comes into play. So we're finishing up for today. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I appreciate your time and I uh, hope that this was a benefit to you.